share apart Mitch before. Oh, we're live. No. Uh, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna we're, Not we're Mitch. We're Mitchless, Glenn. So I, I'm I'm the new Mitch. You're the new Mitch. Glenn is yeah. the new Mitch. Yeah. So You've got me. more hair on your chin than Mitch can grow all together. No. Well, this is this is um I, I couldn't start shaving until I was 37 years old. Okay. And so this is like a token effort that has taken me since 37, so 20 years to grow, and it's yeah, okay. that's as long as it gets. So awesome. yeah, it's uh, I feel I feel for Mitch. I'm, I'm I was in the same boat till I was yeah. So I reached puberty at 37, so which is rather bad. Right. Uh, it's uh, Mitch's voice. My voice still cracks, and I was like, "Oh, puberty is awesome, guys." Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh, Thank we're. You. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining, Glenn. Um, we're joined by 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 Glenn. Is it lavender? I should have asked you before we yeah, even went like the, yeah. like the flower. Yeah, yeah. And my um, first name means valley, so I'm Valley of Lavender. Valley of Lavender, and um, easy, and Martin is joining us. See, it's one fifteen in the morning in Germany, and Martin is is tuning in. That looked a little bit like a Zig Heil, but it wasn't. It was a wave. <laughs> So, Martin, you know, that no, Martin, I wasn't, <laughs> you know, Martin, Martin is, a, is a fabulous guy, and he's one of the few Germans who has a sense of humor, so uh, it's okay, we can, we can, okay, we, can. we got the winky face after the, the Nazi okay. joke. Don't mention the war, I mentioned it once, but I think I got away with it, but other than that, we're good. Did you say the war or all? Oh, I missed that, you, you broke up, sorry. Oh, I just said, did you say the war or the wall? Yeah. I mentioned the war just just once, but I, I think oh, I got away. With it. I don't think he noticed, but now I've said it three or four times. He might be picking it up. <laughs> there we go. So so Glenn is uh, is joining us from Australia. So if there's a little um, uh, if there's a little disrupt in the broadcast, it's probably because we're you know half a world away. It, you can see you're not as still as you are. You can't. No, you can't I, I can. Yeah. This yeah, I can I can tell <laughs> you really take advantage of that optical stabilization. Huh? You <laughs> be down the street. <laughs> yeah, it, our vi vibration control. Oh, my goodness, what, I can't I can OS when I'm talking to a Tamron man. Right. I I yeah, I need I need I need uh, a stabilizer for my steering wheel. You know, <laughs> you start getting old, dude. The shakes come in. So so, Glenn, uh, you're a world traveler, but you're at home right now because everyone's kind of at home right now. Yeah, stuck stuck at home and uh, with the horrible kids and the horrible wife and no, no, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, she just she just handed you coffee. I heard her. She was like, "Would you like some more coffee?" And she, you were like, yeah, sure. no, but I did make her one this morning, so it's kind of quid pro quo, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. I've I've been in lockdown since March the twelfth and um, homeschooling the children and uh -huh. uh, my my entire business is is one on one to one or one or small group workshops is a lot of my business so that's all completely stopped um so no income for you know, over two months which is which is tough and of course uh, the other part of my business is is photo tours traveling the world and um who knows when that'll be back on track as well so right. yeah i've canceled everything for the rest of the year and my next trip's not till march next year and who knows if that's going to go ahead you know right it's a crazy, crazy world for photographers out there. And well, a lot of people in general, but especially photographers. Yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's, I hate saying the word unprecedented because, you know, it's bandied around so much at the moment, but it, it's, you know, so I'm, I'm 56 this year and you know, never experienced anything like, I never thought I would experience, I never prepared to experience something like this. And, you right. know, I'm sure that's the same for most of us. So it's kind of learning a new reality and, uh, I had to go out yesterday. So in Australia, we're slowly starting to ease restrictions a little bit. Um, you can um, visit up to five people now in a in a, a place. Um, sure. To go out yesterday, the day before yesterday, so my father-in-law took a fall, and I had to go and help him get into a car to get to the hospital. And um, I've decided I'm not sure I like out anymore. I think in is much nicer than out. You know, I yeah. feel like you being in this little cocoon, and the real world can just stay out there. You know. Right. It's people are ornery right now. Uh, especially they come, I've been working at the camera shop for like three days now and they're just like, they expect bang, bang, bang. And it's like, hold on. Like I haven't helped a customer. Oh, like, I'm not yeah. ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Who's, so, who's ready to up the pace again? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of weird. Yeah. 
So if you're out visiting your local camera shop or any kind of local business or big business, I see the employees, they're, you know, getting back on their feet too. No sudden moves, no loud noises. No sudden, yeah, it's like, hey, where's my <laughs> six by nine? And I'm <laughs> Stopping people back to reality is not good, you know? Right. So we're going to talk travel portraits. If everyone is tuning in, you're like, man, get to the point already. But that's kind of the, the show. It's camera I'll shot. I'll do a new podcast on photography. We've, uh, we're the world's longest running podcast. It's, we're up to like 470 episodes over the last 15 uh -huh. odd years or whatever. Um, it's an hour long podcast. And in that 470 episodes, I think it's 15 minutes of photography talk. So if, you, yeah. if you think you're going to stay on track and stay on photography, we're going to be you know, a bit disappointed. Yeah, disappointed yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and so, you've been watching our show. This is our forty-first show. Um, oh, happy anniversary! In a row, but Mitch is. This is the first time Mitch has missed a show. Isn't it ridiculous? So I feel special. Yeah. That's good because that's like different. You know, it's not the same old, same old. Right. Exactly. We're gonna change it up a bit, and then he's gonna join us later, hopefully, when he gets gets done with work. So. But, um, but we're going to talk uh, shooting portraits while traveling, travel portraits. And then I'd like to t touch on, on workshops, too, because you've gone a lot of cool places. Uh, yeah, so I do, I do photo tours to cool places. I do right. workshops in cool ones. Okay. So a, work a workshop to me is a one- or two-day event, um, sure. six, to, six to 12 hours, where the only thing that's important is the lesson, not the images. Okay. So at a workshop, I'm here to teach you skill sets that you can replicate mm -hmm. and do at home. Um, but the photos we take in the day are, are totally unimportant. I don't care if the model's picking her nose, if she's blinking. We're not trying to we're not trying to craft a great photograph. We're not trying to build your portfolio. All that's important is is learning stuff. And I, I started doing this a long time ago because um, I found a lot of workshops were portfolio building exercises. You go there, you wouldn't necessarily learn a lot of skills. But you take some pretty photos that you couldn't replicate and never do again yourself. Um, so right. pretty much all you're doing is the, the studio guy running the the, the, the the workshop sets up a cool shot. You snap in with the settings he's told you to use, and then somebody else is five minutes. I, I could never understand why anyone would want to do that. Uh, in it. And if you've got a group of people together, and let's say if we all wanted to go out shooting together, the three of us, yeah, me, you, and, well, not Mitch, um, Mitch. then... Understand yeah, that that would be a perfect thing. I'd set something up, we'd all shoot it. You'd set something up, we'd all. Yeah, that's that's perfectly fine to do. But as a workshop where you're teaching, all that matters is that you understand the skill and can replicate the skill. Yeah. So so my workshops are very um, um, very not structured because I'm not a structured person. Um, there's no tech. I, I, I pair everything down to the most basic possible language um, so people can understand stuff like for example um, exposure compensation I don't ever use the terminology it's dimmer switch so it's something mm -hmm. that lightens and darkens your photo because visually that's all you need to know you know uh, is right. what it, what the effect is going to be uh, so lots of stuff like that so I teach uh, natural light portraits and off-camera flash uh, skills and so my off-camera flash it's only manual flash. I don't do any TTL, any high-speed sync, any of that stuff. Uh, it's all manual, and I guarantee you'll get every flash exposure right first shot, every single shot. And if you if you follow my my teachings, flash photography, you can set up an off-camera flash shot in about a minute, and it's very simple to do. Yeah, you know? and it's and it's going to be right every time, consistent. Yeah, you know? so so it's really really good to understand. Then the then the tours are a different thing altogether. They're they're like workshops on the road, but a little bit less teaching. And more about getting great images, more than sure. nailing. Because you, hopefully, you should have learned those skills before you came. You know, right now we we'll the practice, and then we will refine the photos. We'll refine the the composition, the layout, the the, the story, the, the 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 structure of how you've made the image work uh, where possible. And you know, depending on the tour, that's sometimes easier said than done because some are crazy and chaotic and full on, and some are a little bit more laid back. Yeah, sweet. You know, if that makes sense, and I talk. About by the way, just no, I like it. I like it. I like when you talk. Look, Jeff, 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 uh, Jeff Allen says Rick, and I believe this is the Rick he's talking about. Oh, as long as he wasn't putting the P in front of that, that's all. Let's see. Uh, Rick. Is that his real name? I've been, I've been meaning to think for the, is that his real name, Rick O'Shea? I mean, that can't be true. His parents couldn't have done that to him. I mean, Rick is uh, a hell of a, a stage performer. He, he shreds on the guitar. Ah, so this might be. This might um this might be his stage name. 
Yeah, Ricochet. So I'm not going to give it away, though. I'm not going to give it away. Awesome. Um, so, hello, so, Jeff. Hello, hello, Martin. Hello. I can't see who who's on or how many people are on, but uh, right, we've got here. we've got nine people, seven from Facebook and two from from YouTube. So, but are you before we get say it one more time? Almost double figures. Almost double figures. We were in double figures for a while, but you were talking for so long, people left. Yeah, I understand. That's a typical. <laughs> My <laughs> My kids do that. They just try to walk they, up, up. They just walk, walk out of the room. <laughs> so before we get going, we have a question already from Weezy G. He says, "Hi guys, good, good. You have a portrait photographer today. I switched to Canon mirrorless system recently. What lens should he get first? A fifty-one-two or an eighty-five-one-two? I know you're a Cameron guy, but in your opinion, I want to tell you right now. I think you're going to tell him to get an eighty-five-one-two. Is that what you're going to tell him? Um, no, no." No. Don't go, don't go the I'm that route at all. Two lenses, to be honest, it's. Uh, I would say go out and buy a uh, an older one thirty five f two Canon lens and put it on there. Sure. Yeah, that, that's a stonkingly good lens for a mm -hmm. fraction of the price. And right. you've got one thirty five f two, haven't you? I love my one thirty five f two. Yeah, you can get it it's, for like five hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, it's a it's a six hundred dollar lens, and it will uh -huh. walk. Yeah, okay. It's not going to shoot 1.2, but you know, 1.2, I can't get both eyes. I can't get one eye in focus, let alone both eyes in focus. You know, right. um, and it's soft. Yeah, you know, I know people like the look, but you know, I'm more about story and um, drama and interest than fuzzy out of focus. Okay, yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm anti. I'm anti a lot of this stuff. I'm, I'm very much a, yeah. So as I always say, yeah. I, it's just an opinion. It doesn't really mean anything. Just because I've got an opinion doesn't mean it's right or wrong. I, my, my firm belief, anytime it comes to buying gear, is, is one thing and one thing only. If you've been lusting after X lens, doesn't matter what it is, or X camera, or you have to buy that one. Doesn't matter what anyone else says. Because mm -hmm. the other thing you could have bought might have been 10 times better, but you're never going to be happy with it because you'll always be thinking, oh, the other one would have done a better job. So if right. you've always wanted an 85 mil 1.2, and someone convinces you to go out and buy a 100 mil macro instead, even though it might be a fabulous, incredible lens, you'll always be wondering, what could I have achieved with that? So you're never going to be happy right. with the, the purchase. So you have to buy the thing you lust after. It's simple as mm -hmm. that. For A, B, C, or D, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you don't have a particular lust, then you've got to be more pragmatic. Now, I teach photographers uh, who are wanting to do this as a business. Now, um, if you can't justify the increase in business, for spending four times as much money over a 135 F2 to buy an 85 1.2. If you can't say, well, that's going to generate X amount more dollars for me, then you shouldn't be buying it. You know, no businessman goes out and spends four times as much money for a 5% increase in quality that no one's going to see and the customers won't care about. The only person who cares about 1.2 is you, the right. photographer. The customer doesn't have a clue. They go, oh, what a pretty picture of little Johnny. It could be out of focus. He can have his finger up his nose and mum loves it. You know, so it, it's it, um, it, it's got to be it, from a purely pragmatic business standpoint, it's got to justify its purchase from an amateur viewpoint where you have money to spend for the sake of it because you because you want to buy what makes you happy. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and that's going to be whatever it's going to be. As a focal range, though, just talk about that. Yes, I would say an 85. I, I hate a 50 mil. I hate 50 mil and I hate 35 mil. Uh, as a focal range. Uh, I hate 24 to 70, frankly. I, I almost never use a 24 to 70 um, zoom. So I would say definitely an 85 or a 70 to 200, get something that's a bit more versatile. Right. Yeah. I notice a lot of your lenses on the photos I'll, I'll show here in a second, a lot of them are shot at 70 to 200. Yeah, all or 15. On the 70 to 200. Yeah. So I, uh, when I do my travel stuff, I have two cameras out. One camera's got a 70 to 200 on it. One's got a 15 to 30 on it. Uh, both Tamron lenses, G2. Yeah, um, G2. Me too, Tamron, the pro team. Yeah. Um, uh, back in my T-shirt says, "Art is subjective, performance isn't." So, for you know, mm. the art is subjective because um, yeah. Tamron or the lens is superior performance or super perform. I don't know what they call them, SP something like that. Um, so, super, super perfect. Yeah, super perfect. Uh, yeah. So, well, uh, things happen so fast; you can't predict what's going to happen. So, when you have no control, you need to be the most versatile you can be. And versatile means zooms, uh, be able to change your viewpoint. Now, I'm a people photographer. I only photograph people. Uh, I don't do buildings. I don't do landscapes. I don't do anything unless there's a person in front of it. Um, if there's a building in my photos, because there's a person there. 
uh, if there's a landscape, it's because there was a person standing in the landscape. Okay, so sure. um, so as a as a people photographer, I can move closer and I can move further away from them. It's not about physical separation. Um, sometimes, like a shot like this, this is done with a seventy to two hundred uh, from a balcony inside a temple. Um, mostly because I've been down there shooting in in amongst all that for hours and hours and hours, a couple of days actually. Um, but yeah, getting the getting a, a, a varying. This is more about different perspective, more so than um, right. um, yeah, just shooting the same. It's certainly not about safety because there's a lot of powder and water getting thrown around down there. And, uh, so this this happened. This is the holy festival in India um, in early March in a town called Vrindavan in a couple of hours outside of Delhi. It's the, it's the center point of the holy festival in India. And the whole floor was about this deep full of pink water and you're walking around barefoot. So two months later on, my toenails are still stained pink. Wow. You know, it's it's, um, it's kind of crazy, yeah. Um, but an incredible festival to shoot. Probably the most fun you can have with a camera is shooting, shooting in this uh, this environment for myself as a people because people are happy and excited and you know, celebrating and it's a great time to catch natural stuff. Yeah. Dave Clark says, uh, Glenn, right. like myself, or I'll just put it on the, on the here. Here we go. He, he, uh, he says that, do you, do you own a, you own a Sony mirrorless camera right now? No. No. Uh, so this is Dave from Tasmania and he's being facetious. He's being oh. Mirrorless. You know, smart ass, as you guys might say. Um, yeah. So I, I shoot for Tamron Japan, and um, I, I was when the thirty-five, the, when the series of uh, prime lenses came out, the twenty, the twenty, twenty-four, and thirty-five. Um, yeah. They sent me the thirty-five mil to shoot the launch images for the for their product. Mm -hmm. Now, a, I hate the thirty-five mil focal length as a, as a standard. <laughs> it's not my favorite at all. Um, but it's for Sony, so I had to use that. Sent me a Sony camera as well. I had to shoot with that. I I shoot with Canon, but not because I'm biased towards Canon. It's just a box. Sure. But you know, I've got big hands. The mm -hmm. Sony's tiny. The controls are crazy. The I, I did not enjoy the focusing in any way, shape, or form. I found it incredibly unresponsive and um, nowhere near as definitive as shooting with a Canon. Um, sure. I'm constantly frustrated using it. Um, I hated that it always fo it would shoot when it wasn't in focus. It would beat that it's in focus when it's, it's completely out of focus and it would keep shooting. Oh, no. right. So it's length of time with equipment is important. Um, right. I have a few weeks here and a few weeks there to shoot with the Sony, but I've got to say I found it a very um, – um, I didn't enjoy the experience. When I'm behind the counter telling someone who is about to buy a, a Sony after they've shot a Nikon or Canon for a long time, I said yeah. – you can't come back in two weeks and tell me you hate this camera. Like, yeah. you yeah. got it. You have to shoot this thing for three months. Yeah, exactly. And you have to go into your custom menus and and set up everything. And and, and um, but guess, a lot of people think you know, oh, what doing, you know what you're doing and know how to set it. But most ninety five percent of people who buy these cameras won't do that. And so, right. and so they, and, or won't even know that they can do that, or won't even enter their mind that they can fix the problems by going into forty-seven subset menus and under uh, page fourteen on on on, on um, menu forty-seven, there's a one thing you've got to click, and the world right. will change. You know, mm -hmm. um, it should be more intuitive to that. If you want to dial up more obscure stuff, that shouldn't be straight away. You know, um, so sure. I just spend the frustrating i mean look the end result i was happy enough with um right so so the, the problem is with shooting also for a, a new lens is um you're not allowed to edit the photos okay so okay. you're gonna shoot straight out of camera no editing other than tiny bit of contrast or you know uh -huh. but effectively no editing allowed whatsoever because you have to be able to show what the lens can do not what right. you can do in production so yeah, yeah. The the pressure, the the stresses of shooting um, of product release images for a new lens when you know your photos are going to be compared to everyone's massively edited photos on the world of the internet is is mm -hmm. pretty tough, you know. And um, uh, so yeah, so that you know, that stress probably doesn't add to the fun of using a camera when you're under that stress to produce quality images uh, as shot anyway. So sure. So this, this is, is this with is, the, a Sony. With, yeah. Well, this is the new 70 to 180. So I got sent this during lockdown. So okay. uh, you couldn't go anywhere. So two minutes down the road from my place is a field. So we just popped out there and uh, late afternoon. But I've got to say, as I said, I love the image quality uh, from the Sonys. That's nothing nothing 
about the quality of the, the, the end result, just the, the user experience shooting it for myself. Um, but I love what this lens does as far as fall off into, into nothing is just gorgeous for a, a zoom lens. And right. um, yeah, it, it, it's beautiful. Love it. So we'll keep going here. Boom. Again, so much not. What was that? It's non edited photo again. So that's. Oh, no. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you're traveling and, and taking portraits, I was asking this earlier, um, you know, some of these uh, are people go to travel to different countries and they see photos from camera companies and they expect to get the exact same kind of scene yeah, um, yeah. Or, or look, or for instance, like, like this. Yeah, um, exactly. And so, um, but you're out there, you know, shooting, uh, excuse me, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher it. Um, it's not a workshop. It's a photo. photo tour. It's a tour. Photo tour. Yeah. yeah. So you set these up. Yes and no. So I mean, it all depends. Okay. So this is this is this is the tricky thing. Um, one thing you can't ever believe, and someone was mentioning this recently, is when they look at a, a like a, 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 tour, a photo tour to Iceland with all the incredible you know uh, mm -hmm. northern lights. Someone asked the question, well, in this brochure, over how many tours were these photos taken to get these photos for your brochure? And that's a really, really great point. I've never even thought to, because you know, my brain doesn't work that way. I've never thought to ask that question before. But you know, if it's taken these people 10 years to get the images to put together one brochure, that's mm -hmm. something to ask about. It's like you know, if you go try to book a wedding photographer and they can only show you one wedding. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on a second. Show me some of the other work. You know? show me, let me see that's some me. consistency over a period. Yeah, I've got the one, but it was. I have good. one good wedding photo, and I'm gonna plaster it all over my Instagram from different angles oh, and crops. Exactly, perfect. You know, different, different. Yeah, you know, black and white color, pop color. You know, the whole lot. Exactly. Um, so you know, so it, it's important to, to to understand a in travel, things don't happen. You know, you know, in your own life, you're not walking down the street and seeing amazing people in phenomenal light, just standing there. Yeah. It just doesn't happen, you know. Um, things do happen. I'm not a big fan of street photography, okay, uh, okay. because um, street photography to me is often some bloke walking past a wall. Mm -hmm. Why is that interesting? Right. Yeah, what, what is it about the person? Tell me something about the person. Tell me something about the, the, the history of the building. Tell me, I don't know, give me some information, not just a guy crossing the street uh, wearing a funny hat or whatever it may be. So I don't do a lot of street photography. Not to say that we don't capture street life when we're traveling because stuff happens and, it's, and if it's dynamic and interesting in and of itself, we will photograph it. Um, but <clears throat> oftentimes you'll get to places. So this shot was taken in Bagan in Myanmar, it used to be called Burma. Um, and on this particular area of Bagan, there's 2,600 temples and stupas over this plain, 2,600 of them. Now, 24, Five two thousand five hundred ninety nine of them are probably empty. So you go there and try and get a photo like this, you're gonna be waiting a long time because there's thousands of these damn yeah. things, and people aren't in there cleaning them like these kids are. So these are BYOMs, bring your own monks. Um, okay. you know, <laughs> <laughs> they come on the bus with you and you split them up. You know, um, they're the mm -hmm. rays of light and natural, but we had to make them sweep the floor to get the dust to come up in the air to create the sure. effect. So it's unlikely. And there's another photograph, if you can flick to a, a, there's another temple shot in Myanmar there with rays of light coming through. Yeah, there we go. It's the same kind of thing again. Um, the kid in the back, his face is lit with my iPhone. You know, so he's got oh, a book. Wow. He's got his iPhone in the book, light, so he's got some light on his face. You know, otherwise it's just not going to happen. The kid, I put those candles there. That kid didn't put the candles. They're too lazy. <laughs> they can't really do anything. They're the worst, they're the worst children in the world. To um, because they're little buggers. You ask them to do something, they do exactly the opposite every damn time until you realize you're the opposite, then they do what you want them to do. Um, so you set this sort of stuff up because, as I said, this temple, out of the 2,600 temples, at a certain time of year, at a certain hour of day, this light comes through. And if you're not there at the right time or the right time of year, it doesn't happen. So what's right. the likelihood of someone standing there lighting candles at that particular time? So um, it's it's what's important to me is when you show a photo like this is you don't pretend it's real. Oh, you know, I walked into the temple and there was these two young novice monks praying and I sneakily took my camera out and put it on silent mode and took some photos. You can't yeah. lie about it, you know. 
I see all the time in World Photography Awards, um, Mr. Wu, the uh, the cormorant fisherman in China with his boat and his hat and his lantern and the cormorant mm -hmm. sitting there with the mountains in the background. And it's, oh, Mr. Wu has just returned from a full day's fishing with his cormorants. Uh, him and his family have been fishing here for 45 years. <laughs> Bullshit. He hasn't fished for the last 10 years because he realized he can make 45 bucks US per shot just about just by sitting there with his bird. And it's a yeah. queue of American photographers and travel and travel photographers stand there to take the photograph. You know, uh -huh. I don't necessarily have a problem with the stuff. I have a problem with that sort of stage where it's Disneyland. You know, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's become that's it's become that all their life is is to sit there day in day out doing this. Um, I have a problem with people pretending it's real, right? Yeah, you know? because it devalues the real stuff when it actually does happen. Yeah, so yeah. I have no problem setting up a shot like this. We've manufactured, we've created a shot, we've created a story, but it's fake. It's it's it's, it's quasi Disneyland. You know, there's nothing. I love Disneyland. There's nothing wrong with Disneyland. Disneyland's great. Yeah, I would set a model up at home and do a photograph of it. No one would complain about that. I would right. you know, pose my own children somewhere, and no one had, people pose wedding people. They pose family groups and have no problem. Right. So the important thing is is that line between honesty and misleading people that this is what they're going to see naturally happening. Um, right. I don't know if I put in there, is there a photograph of like a long um, corridor with some kids running along it at all? Also, in here. Look here. Bum, bum, ba, dum, bum. Let's scroll down for a minute, see if I can see it. No, 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 no. It's oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. No, that's fish. That's not it. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, but there we are. Just, just a couple down there as a kid. There we are. So this is both fake and real. So this oh, photo means more than the previous one. Yeah, there's a couple of them. These photos mean more to me than the other one does because these are bring your own monk as well. We brought them along. But whilst we were setting up our gear, they just started mucking around and playing by themselves. Uh -huh. So any idea we had to set up for a shot is nowhere near as good as what they just did naturally. So, yes, we put them in place, but everything they're doing in the photographs is they're just mucking around and being kids. Sure. So um, it's it's semi-setup. You know, yeah. uh, we put element A and element B together and see what happens. And, but sure. we're, not, we're not controlling what's happening. So we have the, the famous Mark Morris in the house, by the way. Do you, did you, you know Mr. Morris? Yeah, you're the um, the nicest Mr. Mark uh, speaking to us right now. How is it any different than a painting? You're taking known elements and engaging them in a fashion that tells a fictitious story. I don't know that it devalues anything necessarily. Well, we didn't ask for your opinion, Mark. Um, <laughs> when I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And as simple as that. Mark can write a lot. So if he writes any more, it's going to take up the entire screen here. I would say of all the people I read on the internet, Mark's my favorite author. He's, he's, Mark's he's a great author. He writes very, uh, I don't read a lot of Facebook posts, but I almost always read Mark's Facebook posts. He's, he's, he's very eloquent, yeah. And he's kind of an angry man too, which is which I like. You know, so, yeah. He has anger issues, but he doesn't know it. You know. <laughs> There's a legend anyway, around these parts. This, this means more to me as a photograph than the other one of the monks in the temple uh, because... Um, I was surprised at what was happening, and that's always a good thing. When when something happens that gives you joy, when 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 you're laughing because of what they're doing, that's a much more fun experience. It's the experience of doing the shot. People always ask me, "What's your favorite photo?" And I say, "Well, my next one." Yeah, I don't really. I'm not necessarily sure I even like photography that much, but I like the going out and doing the going out, the sharing the experiences, and 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 the the sharing a moment like this with other people. That's a great joy, and if you have something to remember that moment by a good photograph then it's a bonus yeah sure uh so so and then there, then there are some of the more the sort of darker portraits you pulled one up earlier of just a lady with just you know, all black around her face or even that one there will do um mm. so this is a setup shot as well this is me standing in a stairwell going to an underground temple uh and got the this young boy to look up the stairwell at me i'm st standing shooting down but as anything photography it's all about light so if you can create and craft with light uh, you're going to get better photographs. So someone like this, um, doesn't matter how great a face they may or may not have, unless you can light them well, the photograph's going to be boring. And that's half the problem with street photography. You see a great person walking down the street, you ask to take their photo and they say yes, but if you shoot them right where you met them, it's unlikely the photo's going to be particularly good because the light is unlikely to have been any good. 
So the first step is always, can I take a photo? And if they say yes, well, can you come stand over here where the light is better? Sure. Um, if they've agreed to have their photo taken with you, they want it to look good. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I'm always looking, if, I'm, if I see someone walking down the street that I want to approach, I'm kind of trying to engage them visually with my eyes and a big stupid smile on my face, because if they connect with me and smile, then we've already got a connection. But kind of out, out of my peripheral vision, I'm looking for doorways, I'm looking for anywhere where there's some light fall off I can work with to create something a little bit more interesting and dramatic. Sure. Uh oh, it says he's got him. I'm gonna send him the link and we'll see what happens. I'm gonna see if he jumps in. That'd be very cool. Because I'm sick of talking to you already. Yeah. That's oh, right. I mean, I would be too. I've done all the talking anyway, so there's nothing. You have. There. There, was a, um, there was a previous photo like this that you put up as well. If you can pop that one back up of a lady's face in blackness. Because I'll, I'll sort I of explain. Like close to the beginning here, wasn't it? Yeah, I just want to explain the difference between that one and this one, which kind of a similar lighting, but yes, yeah, but different experiences. So this one is a lady in Bangladesh uh, in an aluminium offcut sorting business. So she's got a, a building, very small building, with little shavings of aluminium. She's resizing to different size bags. But mm. it's a dark building. There's, there's no light inside the building. She's standing by the doorway to get some light. So she's naturally standing in beautiful light, which almost never happens. Um, I just positioned myself and then got her face to move a little bit better into the light for me. Um, so it's... It's natural, but slightly posed. Whereas the previous sure. one we did was I've, I've brought him to the location, then I've moved him to the stairwell, then I've told him to look up. Um, so I've recreated this kind of effect that does happen naturally as well. So you sure. always look at for the natural, if you can possibly do it, if you can create something like this, which is authentic, uh, you definitely want to try and achieve it. But it's a balance between if you've got clients on a tour, you can't go a full day without being able to craft at least a few really good images because that's what they expect. Um, sure. You can't go, oh, in four or five days' time, I'm sure we'll have some good photos. No, you've got to, yeah. Day one, I try and produce something like this in the first couple of hours of day one of every tour. So someone's got one in the bag straight away that they can be happy with. And the, they're feeling the themselves and they're like, let's go. Yeah, well, the pressure comes off for, for themselves as well because they've yeah, right. got a lot of money. They're away from maybe family. They've committed to come and do this to take photos. And if they're not getting good photographs, then the, the pressure builds on themselves, the unrealistic expectation. And expectations is a big thing that I, I find people uh, who aren't professionals have unrealistic expectations about what constitutes a good amount of photographs. Uh, if I can take six to ten photos a year that I love, I've done pretty well. That's it. Sure. Six, one every two months. And I go to some great places. Uh, and it's, yeah, if I can pull one photo a tour, that's really, really good, I'm happy, you know? But people are going and wanting 100 or 200 or 500 great photos. And it's just right. not a real explanation, expl expectation. You might get tons of really good ones, but we're talking about yeah, something that will stand out as a, a standalone image by itself as a single frame that is dynamic and interesting, so. That's interesting. We should have done a poll on, on guests on the show, like how many good photos they, they try to take yeah. a year. Yeah. Well, because we had Alex Burt. Say it one more time. How many do you expect oh, to take? Um, that's a good, I mean, I never really thought about it until we started doing this show. You know, uh, I shoot a lot of photos, probably more than most people, just because yeah. I shoot sports, you know? Yeah. And so I'm shooting, I try not to overshoot baseball games, but I'll still, I'll still shoot 12, 1500 photos a game. Yeah. And so out of that, for that 1200, you're expecting 200 really good shots. Got a good, I mean, no. shot use for, for marketing for promo to show off the game but they're not iconic heroic shots they're just exactly your normal level of work right probably yeah, well, i'd say yeah you're probably right like six to ten good shots a year maybe yeah, yeah. So that are like we're talking ones that you personally go wow I've, I've, yeah. yeah not just you not uh, that go above and beyond your normal body of work now your normal body exactly. of work you expect always at every single event to take pretty darn good sport photos Mm -hmm. Every time I photograph people, I expect to take pretty darn good people shots. Right. But the ones that elevate above that are the hard ones to get, but they're special right. ones. And so that's, that's what I'm talking about. If you're an amateur photographer and you're sort of working at this level, it's when you pop those few per year uh, well mm -hmm. above that are your special ones, not, not your normal level of work. As a professional, our expectations is higher that we expect to take really good photographs, but we're talking about really good ones, ones that we'll think about for a while to come. You know? Right. 
yeah, I think Alex Burke was telling us he he's a large format photographer in, in Colorado, and he he tries to walk away with twelve good shots a year, and he's shooting on on film on four by five sheet. Yeah, he's taking fifteen photos a year, so his his ratio is hell of a lot better than ours. I know, right? Yeah, he probably focuses a lot. A lot yeah. harder. So that's my fifty thousand um, photos I took this year. I took six good ones. Yay! Right, I love this photo. Thank you. Um, and very so, dark to me, you know, something. Something about Harrison Ford in this photo to me, you know. But right. this is Indiana Jones. A classic uh, uh, um, shot of something naturally happening that's not set up, you know. So we were driving into this small town. This is just outside of Varanasi in India. Um, uh, one of the best places in the world you can possibly go to photograph people is Varanasi in India. Um, but we we're driving to this small town, this small village. And as we were driving through, there was this building you see in the background. It had three arches like this. And in the middle arch was this old bike this guy's got in his hand, just sat perfectly in the middle of the three arches. This bike was the perfect bike against a wall photo. And every single tour, we set up a challenge that you've got to get a bike against a wall photo because that's like every travel photographer has got one, you know. And so right. we drive in, in, in that little minibus and there's this bike. It's like, everyone's going, oh, look at the bike, look at the bike. Yeah, so we've all got out and we've had to kind of hurry down the street to get to this spot. And we've all just lined up and this guy's scurried in, looking at us like we're going to steal his bike. He's grabbed the bike and... <laughs> if you zoom in on his face, he's got this really suspicious look on his face. And I'll put Mitch in here, and I will zoom in on his face. Oh, he does look suspicious. Look at that look. Hey, Mitch, how are you? Hey, uh, what's going on? Like, my bike. Yeah. Look how relaxed this looks. Sound, I probably sound weird, but I just threw it on my phone because I can't be bothered right now. <laughs> oh, okay, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> me a 12 hour day you know i let you know i've been sleeping for seven straight hours and i'm wide awake and happy to be you know? <laughs> <laughs> work 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 um so, so we're just talking about this photograph that uh, that we've got on screen here at the moment and um uh, as, as being a, an actual event that happened as opposed but of the seven or eight of us that were there at that particular moment i'm the only one who got that shot because i was only because you've got to stay in the moment at all times and be right. thinking about predicting what's happening. So I saw this guy start to rush in. So I started moving from the middle arch across to the left as he scurried away with his bike. It happened, you have two second opportunity to take the shot. Bang, bang, you get it and job done, you know. Um, but I love the shot and it's all about his expression. It's funny enough, I was in this same town, This I took this shot about two years ago. I was in this same town uh, a couple of weeks ago and he walked past again, no bike. So I think someone might've stolen it. Uh, it was, so maybe he had right to be suspicious. Yeah. Right. There we go. Um, just, we just, about. just so, just in the middle there. There's a photograph on screen there at the moment called "Favorite." I think it's called. I can't really read my own Favorite. writing. Right. With so an just, OU. This is, this is taken in Varanasi in India on the Ghats, where people come down to to bathe in, 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 in the Ganges River. But when I say this is a place, an incredible place to go and photograph people, you can see why. You know, um, if you zoom in, you can. It, if you had a, a high res version of that photo, you can zoom in and look at everyone's everyone's faces, and there's a million stories going on, a million little, little dioramas of life and and religion and family, and it's 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 a uh, it's one of my favourite images that I've taken. And I, I don't like many of my own photos, but this one I do like um, because of all the stories. You can imagine as a people photographer, a place like this is heaven. You know, right? Yeah. Um. This one stands out to me a lot. Um, yeah. Just like light. And... Yeah, this this is in the Holy Festival uh, in uh, uh, in uh, this is the Radha Vallabh uh, Temple in Vrindavan in uh, in India for the Holy Festival, and uh, we shot through in this temple for two straight days, um, you know, morning and afternoon as the light changed. And at a certain time of the day, the light would come through that little window at the top. And create the shaft of light straight through, and whoever was standing there became the subject. Obviously, you know, right? Um, um, when you when you go to places like this, do you have to get a permit to bring bring people in, or you just kind of shoot? Uh, this, uh, this is funny. This is this is just as the um, the coronavirus um, was kind of taking off. Uh, uh, well, so in India at this stage, they had like three cases, um, and we travelled. So the whole tour was based around going to this particular festival is, is to photograph the holy festival to go into a particular temple um which is the the birthplace of krishna is where the holy festival is as absolute craziest and you know, thousands of people crammed into this one little spot we got to the door on the morning of holy 
And the security guard said, no Westerners allowed. Because Westerners with coronavirus aren't allowed in there and bang. And this is this is a rule that will only come in that morning. And so it's like, oh my God, that we've we've built an entire tour around coming to this temple. And now we're not allowed inside, you know. And there was no there was no bribery allowed. There was no because they had security cameras on so mm -hmm. they could leave if they wanted to. So luckily, my local guy, I have, a, I have a, a national guide that travels with me and then a local guide in each area because they have local knowledge. He said, come to this other temple. It visually looks exactly the same. It's not quite as crowded, which turned out to be a benefit because um, in the other one, it's so packed. You kind of get washed in with people. You shoot as best as you can, and then it kind of pushes you out the, the far door. You go around and do it again and do it again. It's impossible. Yeah? This one, you could actually stand in there and move around and shoot, which gave you a lot better photo opportunities. So... Um, yeah, we, we walked around this place for, for hours and hours and photographed and, you know, you're trying to find moments of uh, intensity. But what happens is they've got a god, a, a god thing that's covered up most of the time because it's covered up because people will faint from seeing it for being exposed for too long. Then they open it for a few minutes, everyone goes crazy, then they close it again and it calms down. And so you've got this moment of complete madness that you're ready to shoot. Yeah. Right. That's pretty crazy. Um, yeah, it's fun. The next one down is what it's like when when the powder goes absolutely nuts. These are a couple of friends of mine. Um, so the guy on the left is that's Andrew Studer, uh, the photographer from Oregon. I was telling you about that day. You got to check his work out. He's quite phenomenal, and I'm sure he'd love to come on and have a chat with you if you want to do his sure. his lap stuff. His uh, he, he he went viral a couple of years ago uh, for a very famous shot of the guy rock climbing up a cliff face with a solar eclipse behind him. Uh, oh, okay. a so massive photo, and the guy on the right, um, a quarterback for um, the Phoenix Cardinals. So, oh, yeah. yeah, so it's kind of a. Uh, so you can see how much fun it is inside this this thing. The, this powder just at you, swallowing the stuff. It's in your eyes, in your ears, up your nose. Then they throw buckets of God knows what water all over you. So you can try to keep your mouth shut as often as possible. Uh, try, try and keep healthy, you know. And uh, but the craziest fun you can possibly have um, taking photos. Right, they're not keeping their mouth closed, so they must have. Just yeah, got... yeah, it's just madness to be asked, mate. You know, <laughs> times I keep my mouth shut. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, let's go into some like close-ups here. Um, this is a beautiful image. Thank you. So, once again, this is uh, one of the things I love to do is shoot ultra wide and get really close. So this is a 15 mil lens, uh, and I, you know, that guy's hands millimeters away from the lens. So yeah, but it gives you a, a feeling of um, being there in the shot that you'd never get otherwise. You know, you, you, if you use a bigger lens, you don't get that expanded arm. You get that compressed feel, which changes it. There's actually a sequence of two shots. I've got one. So you can see the guy in the back here has just smashed this guy's head with powder, and the powder is exploding everywhere. But I've got a shot of previous, a second earlier where he's got his eyes staring at me, which is powerful as well, just in a different way. Um, sure. So I love that getting wide and getting close and hopefully getting people to feel like they're actually in, in the story. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. This is one of my favourite photographs. This is, um, once again, about real things happening that mean more to you than anything you, that you can contrive yourself. Uh, this is shot in the bottom of a stone quarry in Bangladesh, an incredibly hard working place where these guys work for 12 hours a day carrying massive boulders either on their heads or filled up buckets full of rocks. And if we're down the bottom, there's a group of us down the bottom, and we're shooting like, yeah, with a 70 to 200 lens in this case. And I hear this camera noises to my right. So I turned around. This guy is using his bucket as a camera, taking photos of me. And I turn up and <laughs> taking photos of me. And everything, you can see everything in just that one eye. The expression, right. the cheapness, the humanity, the connection with another person is all there in just that one eye. Yeah, it's it's it, To me, it speaks volumes. And I, I love a story that can say a lot without having a lot of elements. Yeah, sure. that makes sense. So just, just a, 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 it, once again, it lasted a second, two seconds. Mm -hmm. That moment to capture it or, and that's why you, you don't cap, you, you lose a lot of photographs because, yeah. Um, um it, it, things only happen for a very brief period of time when you when you're traveling um how often do you focus like on on detail shots like this is like you know very rarely but i should do it more you know? yeah this is a cool image yeah so this is once again also in bangladesh in a, in a, a, a tie dyeing village where they're just tie dye um fabric and then dry it out and this is this guy's hanging up the fabric to dry 
Uh, again, it, to me, it speaks a lot about the life without a lot of information. Um, and, yeah, you know, I should do it more, but I forget to do it. Yeah, there's so many amazing things happening. And this is the problem. I always say half the problem with travel photography, especially the places I go to, is not culture shock. It's over opportunity shock. There's just too many things happening, too many great photographs that you, you're missing so much that you start to worry about everything you're missing rather than capturing what you can get, you know. Um, and the, the, I think the only reason I shot this in the first place is because everything else looked dull. The, the, the way he was hanging stuff up, I didn't like the lines, the angles, the viewpoint. My, my customers at the time, they were shooting the more interesting thing that I, that I said, hey, shoot this over here, guys. So I'm sort of standing back, oh, I'll just do this as well. And it turned out to be one of my favorite images of the tour. So sure. Funny how it works. Um, um, and then, you know, this obviously is, um, is lit, right? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a shot about, there's, there's four, four photos up from that one is actually the behind the scenes. If you okay. want to click. There you go. So, uh, and this is from one of my presentations. I would only add light if it adds to the image. You, know, you can see what kind of day we've got this late, late afternoon here. Uh, so I carry about 30 pounds of camera gear with me when I travel. Uh, that includes, I carry off-camera flash stuff. I'm an ambassador for Godox. So I carry Godox AD200 flashes. Uh, but I also carry triggers for every brand of camera. So, uh, well, every band that's coming on tour. So I, I email everyone, what cameras are you bringing? And I bring triggers so they can all, so I set the shot up, give everyone triggers and they all get to photograph the images as well. Um, and then, yeah, the, the reason we want to use flash is if you go to the actual image that we've shot, right. down the bottom, um, yeah, we've been able to underexpose the scene, create more mood and drama, put the light where we want to on the subject to, you know, to focus the eye where we want it to be. Um, and uh, the funny thing is when I put this photo up online, all people complained about was uh, the stance of the horse. Apparently, if you're a horsey person, horses shouldn't stand, shouldn't stand like that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's, once again, this is 15 to 30 at 15 mil. I don't know if it's the, the horse is actually standing like that or it's just a perspective angle from the lens. I don't know, but I copped right. a lot of people for this lens, for this photo. That's, that's funny. So before I ask you about kind of like... Uh, storage i know mitch is probably interested in in your your narbox yeah. stuff too um make sure if you're watching right now and you want to ask uh glenn a question just put it in the comments below but let's get to this narbox thing because that's what i've been so, wondering about uh, now, listen, so uh, for years i've done like most people do i carry a computer a laptop around with me when traveling um and it's a pain because i'm already carrying 30 pounds of photo gear actually just got two photos for me if you can just to give sure. another example of uh, what I carry with me, um, two LED panels on stands. Yeah, that's this is the sort of stuff I'm carrying with me because if the light's not doing what I need it to, I've got to be able to create my own light. Uh, once again, right. that's a shot all the streams of light coming in from behind. Uh, I need to have some light on my subject. So we carry LED panels, carry off camera flash, light stands if necessary, a whole bunch of stuff. So the last thing you want to be doing is carrying a, a computer as well because you're already weighed down with your, your baggage allowance. Um, so for a few years, I've been working with a company called Narbox. This is uh, their, their latest generation, Narbox 2. And this replaces my computer. So it's a full quad core um, computer. Um, it's got a 512 gig SSD drive built into it, but you can get it up to one terabyte if you want. And my entire workflow these days when traveling is I'll be out shooting, come, come back to the hotel room, uh, pop my memory card in the side here, and on the other end, doo -doo -doo, pop in an SSD drive, a 512 gig SSD drive. And on my phone, here's, here's what I prepared earlier, on my phone, just pet, press transfer. And I can transfer, in fact, I don't, I don't even need the phone. I can actually do it with the buttons on here if I want to, but I kind of like to use my phone. Um, I can hit trans transfer to both drives, the internal and the external, go have a shower. When I come back out, everything's backed up twice, which is awesome. And then I can open up light, uh, open up the apps on the phone and uh, open up my hero shot for the day, pop into the Lightroom mobile, do a quick edit and pop it up on socials uh, all within five minutes of getting back to the hotel room, which is pretty good. That's awesome. But a lot of guys who shoot, shoot GoPros or shoot video, this can do uh, 4K video encoding um, and you can export out to things like LumaFusion or Adobe Premiere. So if you're sitting on a plane on the way back for 14 hours from somewhere, you can go through and Edits all your, uh, your 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 waypoints in your video, 
when you get to home, you just put on your computer and everything's already part edited for you. You've already saved a hell of a lot of time. Or you can go and just on your phone with your photos, you can uh, Lightroom star rate all your photos. Quick there. And when you get home, import into Lightroom and they're already rated for you. So half your work's done before you even get home. So it's pretty epic. So no yeah. more computer. It's yeah. uh, so it's NAR box. V N A R box. I mean, uh, I'm just gonna put. I'm gonna look it up on Google. These guys, California, California. and I love like these people. So, so we've got a shout out if anyone from NAR box is watching. Um, I I need three more new ones now, please, for this advert. No. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm sponsored by an awful lot of companies. I, I'm very fortunate. Uh, from day one, starting my business, uh, a lot of companies came and approached me and said, "You know, use our gear." And um, but I had somebody on, on Facebook a couple of days ago said, "Oh, we equipped with the sponsored posts because I put a photo up with Tamron, what it was shot with, yeah, Tamron lens." And um, I, I've been I've been doing the tours and the workshops for over 13 years, and never once has one of my sponsors ever, ever asked me to do anything for them. I've never been asked to do a post for them that I wouldn't want to do. Anything I put up is because I want to. It's my genuine right. belief in the product. I'm not a big believer in brand A over brand B. Yeah, is Tamron better than Sigma? I don't know. Does it matter? Um, are they really good? Yes. Are Sigma really good? Yes. Is Aquino really good? Yes. Are Canon, Nikon, what? There's lots of great stuff out there. Um, is Sigma and Tamron significantly cheaper than Nikon and Canon? Yes. So doesn't that make sense to buy those and spend the money? Yes. If you're an amateur photographer and you've got $3,000 to spend, spend $1,500 on the lens and $1,500 going somewhere great to take photos with it or buy a $3,000 lens and sit at home and look at it. You know what I'd rather do? You better take photos. You know, I want to go out there and see the world. Yeah. You know? um, it's, it's, yeah. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense to spend more money on gear than necessary. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, we've got a question by from Al. Uh, Al wants to know when you're shooting these split second moments, are you yeah. using spot spot focus? Uh, I almost always have my camera set on center point focus, just from habit. So if I, but it does, yeah, and one shot. So I'm a Canon shooter, so one shot. So I'll, I'll focus, recompose, shoot all in sort of one movement. Yeah. Right. But if you've been shooting long enough, and this is this is this is a, a thing I say all the time, the time to learn your camera is not when you're traveling. You should be trying to figure out which buttons do what whilst you're on, on, on a trip. That's what you have to learn before you go. It, the camera should almost become um, an extension of your hand. So to do stuff like people ask me all the time, well, what were your settings? I'll go, I don't know. I didn't look. I didn't care. They were good enough. Yeah, they were the right. Mm -hmm. the, I use the facetious answer all the time of the right ones because um, if they're the wrong ones, the photo wouldn't have worked. You know? right. um, so stuff like you know focusing recomposing shooting is also instinctive after doing it for so long that you don't think about it so you have to actually when someone asks a question like they have to go oh what do i do i, I don't really necessarily know you know um uh if i'm but i make decisions if i've got a little bit more time so if i'm doing a portrait it's like well is the background important or not important what's well, a depth story so it's either add more aperture or reduce aperture to get rid of depth that's about the only conscious thought and the other two settings, ISO and shutter speed, it's just, well, is it going to give me a shutter speed that's usable? The actual number doesn't kind of matter unless the subject's moving. You know, I'm not doing sports. Um, so I'm always thinking um, settings in regards to story, depth of story. Um, when you're walking down the street, that's a great question. I'm often going to be in um, full manual, but with a shutter, set with a shutter speed that I know I can handhold without any I have terrible unsteady hands. So... I need a, a decent shutter speed. We already saw that earlier today. Yeah, 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 it's terrible. So I need a yeah. decent shutter speed, and um, I need uh, uh, there's an old thing in travel photography, f8 and be there. You know, there's no time to choose. I, I tend not to do f8. I might be on 5.6 all the time. So I'll be 5.6. Let's say 250th of a second shutter speed, and I'll be in auto ISO. So I can be following and moving around and letting the, the ISO worry about exposure, and it does a crappy job sometimes but more often than not it does a reasonable job um and that's the only way you can prepare for the unpreparable the stuff that's going to happen with you when you're least expecting it because you, there's no time to set any settings um but at least with those two things set those parameters of shutter speed and aperture set i know i've got a reasonable chance of getting something and that's kind of all you can hope for sometimes and as i said you miss a lot of photos it's always it, photography is like fishing um it's always the ones that get away you think about the most 
You know, right. it's the, the, the photos, oh, it just didn't quite, oh, there's iconic photos that you just didn't get or the person wouldn't let you take their photo. Um, is, 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 is always the thing you think about. And I think that's what drives you to go out again, to go out and to keep shooting, is to go and try and not miss the next iconic moment, to capture right. that thing that was special um, because you didn't last time. Yeah. For sure. Mitch. One, one thing I meant, uh, so look, I know I talk a lot. One thing okay. I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk about earlier, was um, why I photograph people. Uh, I have a big thing of A versus the. Okay. So to me, uh, street photography versus what I call street portraits, which is when you go and actually talk to people and photograph them. I want to photograph the person, not a person. Okay. So street photography is a lot of photographing a person walking down the street or a person in a place or a person doing something. I want to go up and meet somebody, find out a little bit about where they live, what they do, what their name is, something that enriches my experience of the place I'm at. Then I want to photograph the person. Uh, or my imp in my impression of the person, the person I met at that particular moment. That's all you can ever really capture is your impression of a person. But I want to be able to capture the person as best as I can, not just a person, because the photo to me has less relevance and less interest. Sure, that makes sense. Hopefully, yeah, I I, yeah. I agree with that. I'm not a big uh, person people per people person. A person so people, yeah, I've, I've been a person a people. people for a long time. Purple people eater. What have, What are you laughing at, Mitch? You show up late and you laugh at me? Yeah. And he doesn't even talk. He yeah. doesn't even. <laughs> I know. I, I'm a little, oh. uh, I'm kind of lightheaded. <laughs> are you just going to, you should probably, are you eating something? Have you eaten yet? No. You, you have, have food in your house? Yeah. Not right now. <laughs> you don't have food? Do you have anything to ask Glenn? Um, no, I, I, mean, I like what you said about uh, photography is like fishing. Uh, that's, I like that's pretty accurate. That's a good yeah. way to describe it. Um, yeah. And these photos, the, at least the ones that I've seen already, are fantastic. I really think they're great. And I'm like, Thanks. I'm bummed that I missed the first half. I mean, trust oh, me. You I it. much. <laughs> it's me waffling on. Uh, I used the clarity slider too much for your choice, though. I'd, I'd have to say, uh, I guess, you know, no, no, no pensions for dislike of that. Um, the, here, here's not, here's, this is this guy's called the Red Barber. Uh, in uh -huh. Baranasi, in India. I mean, again, you know, this, this is a pay-to-play guy. There's places in the right. world where you can't photograph people unless you pay, and that's Mr. Wu in China. Uh, any old lady in a in a square in Havana in Cuba with a big cigar and a funny hat, you right. pay. And a little tip: if you ever go down to Havana and you see a beautiful old lady with a big face and a, a big hat and a big cigar, and you walk up to her and say, "Can I take your photo?" She says, "Yes, two dollars." Yeah, you know, two dollars is pretty good. You go click, 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 click. She goes about ten dollars. Thanks. It's two dollars. Oh, two dollars a click. <laughs> Make sure whenever you do these pay-to-play things, you negotiate your rate and no surprises. You know. Um, so we we actually put this guy in a boat and brought him from the other side of the river to this side to the the bank to get this big expansive sky. So there's no buildings in the background. Uh, and once again, off-camera flash. Um, yeah, and try to add some mood and gravitas to the image that wasn't necessarily there in the, in the natural light. Sure. But yeah, that's kind of my shtick is wide angle portraits with you know, moody skies. So I'm a moody kind of guy. There you go. Yeah, I life. like that. This is, yeah. is this the same beach? Same dude. So yeah, it's just different. different, different. Oh, my wife's laughing at my bad jokes in the background there. Um, yeah, same beach, just different process. Instead of making the background blue, I've made it brown and arty. Yeah, oh, I'm, yeah. I, I don't know how to use Photoshop. I've got no. I, I'm absolutely diabolically bad at post production. So um, yeah, I can do. A few, I've got a few little tricks, and that's kind of about it. And so most of my photos kind of look the same. <laughs> no, I like it. You gotta have someone to laugh at your bad jokes. You know, I'm with you on that though. I don't. Uh, I don't really mess around with Photoshop too much. You know, I, I, I think I would kind of like to. I'm just no good at it. But if we look at. Um, Stop that photo. Just go back down one below the group shot. This next photo down. Yeah, that one in the middle there of the, the lady there. Um, so this is as shot straight out of camera. So we want to try and produce the photographs. A lot of the time I only shoot JPEGs. I don't shoot raw very often. I, on tour I might, but anywhere else it's pretty much only JPEGs because I'm too lazy. Um, but this is one of the great things about photographing people. This is a lady in a small village in Vietnam. She's 92 years old. This is knowing the bit about the person rather than a person. This is the first photo ever taken in her life. Really? First ever photo, 92 years old and never had a photo taken. And uh, it's pretty special, you know? And, and so we right. got to take 
got his photograph. We then went and got the images printed and took them back to her and, and gave them to her. And that's a special moment, you know. Um, on my last trip to India, I took a small little HP sprocket printer with me and printing out photos. Uh, we're in a, 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 a brick making uh, kiln and factory in the middle of nowhere in India. And I'm printing out photos of the guys working in, 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 the, in, the, in the brick kiln. And first photos they've ever had taken in their life, and first photos of themselves they've ever actually physically owned. And you can tell they get the, and they put it to their hearts and they hold it, and and and, you, and there's almost tears. In the, and then they'll run around and show all their family and friends. Yeah, that's that's what makes photography special to me. Yeah, that that's, that's something we can give back because um, we get we take images for granted so much because we take so many of them. But that's one photo they've probably only had in their entire life might be the only one they'll ever have. That's quite incredible. Right. Yeah. So you, I was going to ask you earlier. Oh, go ahead, Mitch. Uh, I didn't say anything. He's oh, going to um, say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to ask you earlier. Um, so when you when you're going, you said you want them to look cool, but or you want them to look nice. Like you want you don't want to take a picture of someone um, where you find them. Sometimes you want to move them so they look nicer in yeah. in better light. Do you yeah, exactly? Do you so ever, Look on. Right. Look on. Oh, do you ever do you ever bring the photo? Do you ever have do you ever try to figure out how to get that photo to them? You know, or, or yeah. is that I guess like if it's at all possible. So um for example, one one day I was I had a day off in New York and um uh, I spent 18 hours walking the streets of New York, going up to someone asking to take their photograph, and after after they said yes. I'd ask them to give me a recommendation where I could go in the neighborhood to photograph somebody interesting. There might be a shopkeeper. Or something. So I, I followed people's advice all day long. And lots of people ask for your photographs. Uh, can you get, Can you send me the photograph? And I'll always say no, because if I take their details down on a piece of paper, I guarantee you I'll lose it. Uh, right. And then I'll feel bad for the rest of my life. So I'll give them my right. card and say, look, send me an email. Tell, them, tell me where we met, what day and what you were wearing, and I'll get you the photo. And uh, so it puts, it puts the responsibility back on them to if they really want to connect with me. In a place like this, if it's possible to, um, to get print, we, especially something as iconic, the first ever photo, we did everything we could to get photos for her. Um, we met another man on this tour where uh, he insisted we go and get the photos printed and he'd bring them, bring them back to him. But not only that, before that, he went to everyone's cameras and chose the images that he liked. You know, he so was he, the... He, it was funny. It was, it was a homeless man in Vietnam. He said, "We can take his photograph, but he must choose the background because he wants Vietnam to look good." Then he go through all the photographs and choose the ones. He tells us which ones to, to, we have to delete. That one, delete that one, keep that, one. and then you, and then we have to go and get those printed for him. So when you have experiences like that, that's pretty cool and always very. And now memorable. he's acting in Vietnam films. Exactly. Yeah, he's actually the president. Yeah. Um, but. Um, so that's why that little HP printer is fabulous. Yeah, you can print out an image in you know, a minute and give to people, and uh, for yeah, instantly. And there's no internet. There's no way they're gonna, you can be able to get the photos. There's no place you can go get prints done. There's no address to send things to. There's a language barrier where you can't break through. There's all, all that sort of stuff. So those little printers, right. it's costing you about sixty cents a photo to do, which is nothing for the experience you've had. Uh, and I would much rather give someone a photograph of themselves. Than a couple of dollars, because a, a couple of dollars sets up tourists equal money. Right. A photograph means a tourist is a friend. Yeah, right. and the very, very so I always like to say I don't like going to places like Havana where everyone expects money for photos. Mm -hmm. um, I like going to places where people are as curious about you as you are about them, and that's always a great place to be. That's why India is such a fabulous place. So there's 1.3 billion of them, so not everyone's been photographed yet, which is good. I'm working on it. I'm trying the hardest. Um, yeah. but they will call you over and ask to have their photographs taken. So if you're a bit scared about photographing people, they will break you of it because they'll demand you do it. And right. it'd be fun and, 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 and you get through all that kind of stuff pretty well. So That's awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Well, I think we, we touched on a lot of stuff. Can we just or just just go down a bit? So just if you could, just a little bit lower. Down, 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 down. There's a shot. Just... Right above the above the the shaft of sunlight one right above no above the crowd that one there yeah oh, click on that one for me so this is what I love about if you're going to photograph street action uh, street photography it's got to be dynamic and something interesting happening uh, to me this is very much a Renaissance painting kind of look to it yeah there's a story and things almost a Last Supper kind of picture 
Um, so if you, to me, if I'm going to capture street, it's got to be compelling in and of itself, not just a person walking down the street. Um, there's got to be uh, uh, at least an impression of story that you can make up your own story about what's going on. It's got to be saying something to make it interesting for myself. Don't get me wrong, I've done millions of photographs of people walking past buildings, but over the years, you, you, you refine your taste of what speaks to you as an image, and um, which means you take a lot less because a lot of, there's a lot less instances where something good happens, but right. the, the ones you do take mean more. Yeah, my eyes kind of start at the bottom of this image and they go all the way to the top. It kind of just like builds. Yeah, lots, lots of cool stuff going on. Yeah. And so, yeah, so yeah. you're always, and, and the hardest thing I've always found about photography like this is realizing something's going on that's interesting enough to photograph. Yeah. Because so often you're just looking at stuff happening. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Oh, photograph. Yeah. You have to you get right. halfway through an event before you realize that this is a moment you should be capturing. And sometimes you miss stuff and you go, oh, why didn't I take a photo of that? You know, because right. it, it was amazing. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's only when I'm going through my images afterwards, I'm going, why didn't I do more there? Now, in, in this scene here, I took two photos and walked off. And fortunately, the one of the two was, I found interesting. But it's like, why didn't I realize how good this was at the time and spend some time shooting this properly, you know? Uh, if I had, maybe that lady's hand wouldn't be missing at the bottom of the photo or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, I didn't want to call yeah. you out or anything, but uh, yeah, I'm going to clean it back in. But my Photoshop skills are no good, you know. <laughs> just like some someone else's hand, <laughs> your own hand. Different angle. <laughs> just a white Australian dude's hand. Just like, exactly. I was going to Photoshop my own one in there, really big. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the thing. Is is the hardest thing I find is is being aware enough of what's happening to remember that you're trying to capture this as well not just ex and, and 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 conversely the same thing making sure that you spend enough time experiencing what's happening not just photographing it trying to find that balance right you know? i was going to say that too i find a lot of time in, it's hard in sports photography you're 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 watching and then all of a sudden it happens yeah and so yeah. you can't get caught watching the game because yeah. if it wasn't if i wasn't getting paid i would love to be watching what i'm watching oh, uh cool. this close but at the same time, you have to enjoy um, what you're shooting. Like if I'm out shooting a landscape or, or something like that, you know, take a second to stop clicking and just in, enjoy enjoy the world you're in. Yeah, but you can't be. You, can't, you also don't don't look at the screen. Yeah, in in scenes like this, or, or when you, when you're photographing stuff that you don't know what's happening, you can't take time to look at your screen because the second you look down to check things out, the best thing happens. Uh, right. Or I find this often when I'm photographing festival. Yeah, you'll be shooting a, 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 something that's happening in the festival, and then they stop doing it. So you go, "Oh, what's going on?" And then, but that was actually the build-up to the the main thing. But because you didn't understand, right. it, you know what's happening, you miss the good stuff because you're too busy checking out your screen. So stay in the moment for as long as you can until you're right. sure someone there's sweeping up at the end, and even photographing and sweeping up because that can be pretty good too. Right. Right. You have a lot of memory in your camera. Just keep shooting. You don't need to look at the back of your screen until you're back home. Yeah. It, it, it stay in the moment because that, that's often when the best shots happen is when you get past your own initial excitement as well. You know, because I, I try and say, especially when we're doing a crafted portrait, when we, we've asked someone to take their photograph and they said, yeah, you've only got two or three minutes with somebody, maybe, or five minutes with somebody. So you've got to be right. really fast. But so I would say you've got to, you've got to be get excited. Oh, look at this great face. But then get get unexcited, disengage. What am I going to do? Where am I going to put them? How am I going to set it up? Do all that, get the exposure, then re-engage and get excited again and enjoy the moment. But if you don't take that time out to disengage, you miss stuff. So sure. it's, it's trying to train yourself into allow yourself to be excited, but allow yourself to stop and then get excited again. For sure. Well, Glenn, I think it's it's dinner time here in the United States of America. I need another coffee. I know it's almost it's about time for brunch there in Australia. Exactly, my, I'm sure my wife and children are eagerly cooking something up for me right now. What's the? Uh, he, he like looks around the room and everyone's like, no. Um, <laughs> but before we go, Mitch and I want to know what the craziest bug you you've you've had in your like your near you is in Australia. Oh, good. But, oh, I've been I've been bitten by multiple snakes. Uh, poison, the world's most deadly poisonous snakes. Um, oh, really? I've got, I've got snake stories up the wazoo. Um, uh -huh. So, yeah, a lot deadly spiders, deadly snakes. I, I took yeah. a ride in a stingray once. Uh, 
A 16 foot mako shark swam past me about four foot in front of my face once. Um, lots crocodiles. A friend of mine fell off a boat in a, a, small, a small dinghy up in up in the tropics. He was watching a crocodile go under his boat and he fell out straight on top of it. <laughs> get wet apparently. That's how, how far I see what. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's. I'm a mad fly fisherman. Okay, so I, I tend to creep up the sides of rivers looking for fish, and because you're walking so slowly, you step on the snakes. Right, and if you're going to step on a snake in Australia, they're almost all deadly. So you, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can have um, some experiences. Yeah, and I'm a snake magnet. I, I can get out, and there'll be a snake everywhere I, I go. Just anyway, so uh, much fun. sure. Have you uh, <laughs> hold on, you froze. Me that. Oh, I froze. Sorry, I froze, didn't I? Did I freeze? Did I said the scariest moment of all. I'll tell you one quick fishing story. I was fishing on a small river. I had a little rainbow trout on, and it's bouncing around. I look up, and a tiger snake swimming across the river, and he's stuck in the current. He's coming downstream, looking over his shoulder at me, and I'm looking at him. He's come up my leg because uh, thinking I'm a tree. I've caught him behind the back of my head. I've thrown him on the bank, landed the fish, walked off thinking what a, what a, what a big man I am, you know. Walked around the corner, and a sheep has jumped out of a bush and almost gave me a heart attack. You know, so you go, from, you go from being a he-man to, oh, a sheep, yeah. a sheep. You know? well, as long as you're not getting, yeah, as long as you're not getting rained on by spiders or something like that. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah they're bad because they, 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 off the trees at night, you walk along and go into your face, which is, which is oh, you know, not good for your job. Would, you know? yeah, it wouldn't have to bite me to kill me. I would just die of fear. We have, we have birds with spiders here. So. Oh, dude, like yeah. the size of like your whole head. Yeah, they, they they eat birds or they eat baby birds for a living. Yeah, it's it's uh, oh, been crazy stuff. No. no, thank you. If I ever come down there, I have to stay in the city or something like that. City living, or they're probably in the city too. I don't know. Yeah, they, well, you still have the snakes from the city, yeah, in the parklands yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, pretty common. Man, well, Glenn, we really appreciate you coming on and and yes, appreciate you watching watching the show every morning in Australia. We are, Mitch. We have the number one morning show for photographers in Australia. We, yep. Yeah. And also the only, the only morning show, but yeah. Let's the, only morning, <laughs> the only morning show. So awesome. Well, this has been Camera Shop Talk uh, for whatever day it is. And um, uh, we'll be back on Monday. Mitch will be uh, coming to us live. Are you going to be in, in Illinois on Monday, Mitch? Uh, I can't even think about days right now. I think. The, yeah, Monday <laughs> is... Uh, Monday the eighteenth. It's the eighteenth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be there if it's the eighteenth. Coming live to us from the great state of Illinois, as opposed to coming to dead for us from today, because it's yeah. Uh... <laughs> 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 his he he sent me a picture of his, his of his Amazon truck at seven thirty this morning. And I knew it was going to be bad if he was texting me his pick, the back of his truck at seven thirty, and he said, "I'm not going to make it. And it's going to be a bad day. It's going to be a bad day for Mitch." It shows yeah, the world when yeah? people are buying from Amazon again. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we appreciate all the work you do for Amazon and all the work that you do for the camera shot, Mitch. So. Well, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Let's. I told Glenn that it was going to be a bad sign off, and I'm proving uh, to him that it's going to be. Consistency is not a bad thing, you know. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's get out of here. We'll be back next Monday, um, and we'll talk about uh, something photography-related. So that's going to be it. Thanks All for right. having me. See you guys later. <laughs>